Welcome. My name is Troy Maxwell. I am the senior pastor here at Freedom House. I want you just to look at your neighbor and say, you look so much better than you did last Easter. Come on, just look at him. So much better than you did last Easter. How many of y'all enjoying a little March Madness? Are you, how many of y'all enjoy that? I love it. Uh, my, my team, the VCU Rams, were kicked out in the first, second round. Uh, they got beat, and um, I enjoyed a little bit of game last night. I like Oklahoma a little bit better than Oregon, uh, just a little bit. And so it was a great, great time last night. I played a little basketball growing up, a little bit of hoops. I'm, I'm okay. You know, I'm average, maybe a little below average, maybe like C minus, <laughs> maybe D plus. A little bit of game. I'm, I'm a, uh, we play occasionally when I go to this youth camp that I do, and uh, we usually invest in the younger folk and the younger guys. They always think they can beat us old guys, uh, but we're way stronger than them, and so we just push them around pretty bad. Um, in my hands, this ball, this is a nice ball, it's worth about $60 in my hands. However, if you put this ball in the hands of Steph Curry, everything changes. It's worth way more than $60. I figured out last year he scored a total of 682 points last year. He'll, he'll probably exceed that this year. Uh, he's on a really good train right now. Um, in his hands, this ball is worth $16,000 a point, according to 2015. $44 million when you put this ball in his hands. Um, I, I got a football here. Played a little football growing up. Enjoyed football. Nothing better than putting the smack down on somebody. Men, you know what I'm talking about. It's good to hit somebody every now and then. I really enjoyed it. Um, however, in my hands, this football is worth about $30. But if you put it in the hands of Tom Brady, everything changes. Um, I was going to bring up Cam, but I'm still a little depressed. <laughs> my medicine's working real well, but I'm still a little, a little depressed about it. You put this ball into Tom Brady's hands, who will surely be at Hall of Famer, one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. Whether you like him or not, he's still a great quarterback. Um, he, it's worth $57 million. You put it in his hands. I got a baseball. Um, played a little baseball growing up. Made the all-star team twice, just two times, when I was 23. Um, little league. <laughs> I love baseball. I love watching baseball. Nothing better than going to the, to the baseball game. I love our stadium here in Charlotte. It's one of the most beautiful stadiums around. I love it. In, in my hands, however, this baseball is worth about $12. But you put it in the hands of Clayton Kershaw, of the L.A. Do Dodgers, it's worth $215 million. Wow. It's worth a lot more. Now, this is my jam right here. <laughs> golf ball. Okay, I, I love golf. I enjoy playing golf. I play golf quite often. Matter of fact, today when I'm finished this last service, this is my fifth one that I preached. I'm going to go home, pour myself into the couch, and uh, I'm watch golf for the rest of the afternoon. And I, I, I've, I've tried out three times to make the Charlotte Amateur. Uh, I've missed it three times in a row. Last year I missed it by one stroke. On the last hole, I bogeyed it pretty bad. This year I'm going to make it in Jesus' name. Can you all pray for me in August, all right? However, however, even if I make it, this ball's still only worth about $3.95 in my hand. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, it's a nice golf ball, too, Titleist Pro V1. But you put this in the hands of Tiger Woods, and it's worth $1.3 billion over his career. It's a lot of money. I got three nails here that I bought at the hardware store. In my hands, they're worth about $3 a piece. But in the hands of Jesus, everything changes. Everything changes. See, these nails in the hands of Christ mean our eternity. These nails in the hands of Jesus change the dynamic of our life. They change our perspective. They change everything about us. They change the way that we see life, the way that we engage life, the way that we have relationships. See, these nails in the hands of Jesus changed mankind forever 2,000 years ago. See, what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about what it looks like for you and I to put our life in His hands, into God's hands. Now, in Luke chapter 23, there's a very interesting verse that Jesus makes a statement, his last statement. Jesus, as he's hanging on the cross 2,000 years ago, and on this hill of Golgotha, 
He's been beaten, he has been bruised, he has uh, been criticized, ridiculed in every way, shape, or form. And he makes seven distinct statements as he's on the cross. Now, I personally believe that when somebody makes their last statement, it's a very significant thing. When, when somebody uses their dying breath to make a statement, I'd say we listen to it, especially if it's God. Would you agree? Come on, church, would you agree? Come on, I want you to look at your neighbor. Just look at him and say, in his hands. Come on, say, in his hands, in his hands. Look at your other neighbor and just say, in his hands, in his hands. Here's what Jesus said. The last thing that he said, Luke chapter 23, verse 46, Jesus called loudly, and this is what he said, Father, I place my life into your hands. Now, this wasn't Jesus in a whimpering kind of last-ditch effort cry. This was not so much in weakness, this was a voice of not defeat. This was a voice of victory. Notice it says that he called loudly. Father, I place my life into your hands. What Jesus was doing for you and I was letting us know that no matter what circumstance that we face, no matter, even if it's death, God can change it. See, God is the great resurrector. He loves to resurrect dead things. He loves it. He loves the underdog story. He loves it. He loves it when there's no other direction that you can go. There's no other way that you can get out of the situation because, see, that's when typically we turn to God. When we can't do anything else, when we have no other place to go, when we can't borrow any more money, when we can't go any farther in our life, that's when we get to the place where we say, God, I finally commit myself, I finally give myself into your hands. Jesus is letting us know that this death would not end in defeat, but this death would turn into victory because Jesus knew the ultimate outcome was that God would raise him from the dead. Now, everybody was looking, was like, oh no, he's gone. Our Savior's gone. Even the devil thought that he had won when he put Jesus on the cross. I know when you think about it, when you've seen it on, in movies, how he's portrayed on that cross, I know in his mind, in his heart, he knew that God was going to raise him from the dead. That's why he told his disciples over and over again, hey, it's better that I go away. I need to go away. I need to place myself into God's hands. And see, when we do that ourselves, things change. Look at somebody and just say, in his hands. Things change when you put yourself in his hands. Your worth changes when you put yourself in his hands. Your outlook on life changes when you put yourself in his hands. See, here's the thing that Jesus did that I love. And he didn't have to do this. He died. And then when he was raised from the dead, he actually came back to his disciples, to several people. You can read about it. He he showed himself to Peter. He showed himself to his disciples over and over again. Matter of fact, he spent over 40 days with his disciples. He didn't have to do that. Jesus Jesus had already told everybody, I'm going to die. I'm going to be raised from the dead. You destroy this temple, I'll raise it up in three days. He didn't have to come back, but he did. And why I believe he did is to make certain truths evident to you and I through his conversations with those that he revealed himself to. One of which is found in John chapter 20. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 12, there's this young lady by the name of Mary Magdalene. Now, if you have read anything in the Bible, if you're kind of new to the Bible, Mary Magdalene was a bit of a case, okay? She had seven demons that Jesus cast out of her. She had been on the Ricky Lake show back in the 90s. (laughs) She had been on Maury Povich, who's my kid. Is this my child? You know that one? He's, she, was in, she was on, uh, she didn't make it to Oprah because she had seven demons, so they didn't know if she was going to actually, you know, kind of manifest in the middle of the Oprah show. Um, uh, she, she had just been on every television show. They wrote books about her. She had a demon for every day of the week, Monday demon, Tuesday demon. She had seven of them until she came into contact with Jesus. Aren't you thankful that Jesus still casts out demons? Aren't you thankful? I'm glad, you know, I know some people that could still use a little casting out myself, amen. 
So Mary Magdalene, she spends a couple years with Jesus after she's been relieved of her demonic oppression. And she is the first person that Jesus reveals himself to after he has been raised from the dead. Notice what it says here in verse 12 of John chapter 20. And she, Mary Magdalene, saw two angels. How many angels? How many? Angels in white sitting, one at the head of the table where Jesus had laid and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, girlfriend, is a Maxwell translation, girlfriend, why are you weeping? Why are you crying, girl? What's up? It's okay, sweetheart. She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, notice what happened, she turned and saw Jesus standing there. However, did not know that it was Jesus. You know, and that's sometimes how it is in life. We turn from our problems. Jesus is standing there, and we don't recognize him. He's right there. For some of us in this room, he's been there all along. He's just waiting for you to recognize him. He's waiting for you to include him in your situation. He's waiting for you to say, hey, can you, can you come help me in my marriage? Yeah. He's been standing there all along, just kind of waiting patiently, just waiting, waiting for you to turn to him. And then she, he says the same thing to poor little Mary. She, he says to a girlfriend, why are you crying? Why, why are you weeping? Why are you, whom are you seeking? Isn't it interesting? He knew that she, that he was the one that she was looking for. Jesus never asks you a question that he doesn't know the answer to. Never. Whom are you seeking? He knew, you looking for me. You looking for me. Peekaboo. Yeah, that's what Jesus does. She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, notice what, he only said one thing. He said, Mary. She goes, oh my gosh, that's you. See, she didn't recognize him until he identified her. I want you to say this with me. Say, in his hands, I have certainty. See, the first truth that I believe Jesus is letting us know by revealing himself to Mary is that certainty of identity brings security. Certainty of identity always brings security. I, I've met people who don't know who they are. I've met a lot of rich people who don't know who they are. I've met some poor people that don't know who they are. The thing that connects them, they don't know who they are. Whether they got a great job, doesn't make any difference. They don't know who they are. See, God will never ask you to do something until you find out who you are. And see, that's what Jesus does. In order for us to recognize him, he will always identify who you are. Because that's the first place that we have to start. Before you launch out on anything, you got to know who you are. A lot of people get into relationships because they want to discover who they are. They think that if I can just get married, if I can just find him, if I can just find her, then I will be complete in them. No, that's not true. Matter of fact, that's why a lot of people, uh, God has not helped you find, he's not allowed you to find that right person because you're not ready. You don't know who you are. You think that they're going to complete you. No, 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 no. Jesus is the only one that can complete you. And you want to take a complete you into this relationship, not a two-thirds you, not even a 98% you. If there's 2% doubt of who you are, then there won't be security when you walk out the plan that God has for you. Certainty of identity brings security. When you put yourself in his hands. He called her by name, Mary. And immediately she recognized who he was. What are we certain of? We're certain of our future when we put ourselves in his hands. We're certain of direction when we put ourselves in his hands. Listen, the world that we live in, there's a lot of uncertain stuff going on. Our economy, very uncertain. Our government, uh-oh, very uncertain. A lot of uncertain things, but there's one thing that you can be certain of, and that's who Jesus created you to be. 
And when you're certain, listen, you will always have peace. See, when you're secure, peace follows security. And no matter what storm you face in life, no matter the hardships that you're dealing with, no matter, no matter what, you can be certain that God is always for you. Always for you. Because he's the one that's directing you. He's the one that has your future. It's not some complicated plan. It's not a mystery. God's not trying to withhold anything from us. He's a good father, and he wants to give good gifts to his children. Do you believe that today? Listen, when when we celebrate Easter, I mean, that's what it's all about, that he is a great, amazing father. I love what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 38. For I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love. No thing. Nothing can separate us from his love. Neither death nor life. Whether I die can't separate me from his love. Whether I live can't separate me from his love. Neither angels or other heavenly rulers, no devil in hell can stop me. No, Evan can, no, no, no angel can stop me from, from his love, can hold me back from his love. Neither the present or the future or the past can't hold me back from his love. Neither the world above nor the world below. There is nothing in all of creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus, our Lord. See, in his hands, we have certainty. Look at your neighbor and say, in his hands, you have certainty. Here's the second truth. He shows up to a guy by the name of Thomas. Thomas gets a bad rap. Because you know, Thomas, man, he's called Doubting Thomas. Listen, I like Thomas. Thomas just asked questions that we, we, were, we were afraid to ask. Other disciples were afraid to ask. One of those questions is, I don't, be- I, I don't believe he was raised from the dead. So you know what Jesus does? Jesus shows up just for Thomas. Isn't that cool to know? He cared so much about Thomas that he showed up specifically. It says in verse 26, same chapter, John chapter 20, after eight days. How many days? His disciples were again inside, Thomas with them. I love this part. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst. I love that. Jesus walked right on through the door. Sometimes you can shut the door in Jesus' face. He says, that's all right, I'll just walk right through it. Put up a wall for me, I'll just walk right through it. I'll just come. I love that. I think about that in my life because, but, you know, 25 years ago, before I became a Christian, I put up all kinds of barriers between me and God. And God says, you know, I don't, I don't even worry about it. I'll walk right on through that barrier. And that's what God does in our life. He will walk through any barrier so he can get, you, get, get to you. He will chase you down, run you down, and be there standing, waiting, whispering your name, whispering your identity. He stands in the midst and said to them, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here. Touch my hands. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, my Lord, my God. (laughs) That's exactly what it said. I heard the CD. In other words, you is alive, Jesus. My Lord, my God. And then look what Jesus says next to him. Thomas, because you've seen, you believed. Look at the next phrase. I love this. Because this is the truth that he is revealing to you and I. He says, blessed are those who have not seen yet believed. Blessed are those who have not seen yet believed. In other words, when you put yourself in his hands, you have hope. 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 I love hope. Aaron was talking about it earlier. Hope. Hope is the confident expectation of good. Hope is knowing, not seeing, but knowing that there's something good around the corner. Hope is what Jesus had when he hung on the cross and he gave his spirit into the hands of God because he knew he would be raised from the dead. Hope is feeling pain, but knowing peace is on the other side. Hope is is dealing with your fears, but knowing that perfect love does cast out all fear, and one day I'm gonna be introduced to that love. That's what hope is. Foolish hope, however, is putting your trust or confidence or some, in someone or something that has no integrity, that has no ability to come through. Putting your trust in the economy, not a smart thing to do. That's foolish hope. Foolish hope is putting your trust in Publisher's Clearinghouse. 
thinking that Ed McMahon is going to come to your door with a big old check. It just ain't going to happen. I've tried it. I remember one year I said, I'm going to win Publishers Clearinghouse. And so I started filling out all the letters that came to me, you know. And all I did was just keep filling out letters that came to me. Every single week I kept getting a letter saying, you're on the next list. You could win. You might get there. One day you're going to. Hey, you could win this. And they sent me pictures of cars and everything. But nobody knocked on my door from Publishers Clearinghouse. It's like, it's like I heard this story, Dr. Edward Seaman tells a story, true story of a Muslim who gives his life to Christ in South Africa. And as a Muslim in that part of the world, if you become a Christian, your family disowns you and ostracizes you. They throw you out. Your friends, you're not a part of my, my, my friendship. You can't be a friend to me anymore. And they ridiculed this young man for making a decision to become a follower of Christ. And they kept asking him, why would you do this? Why would you turn away from your religion and become a Christian? And finally, after many, many times, he said, now, now let, me tell you, let me tell you why I made this decision. It's like, uh, it's like you, if you were walking down a road, and as you're walking down this road, you come to a fork in the road, and there are two people at that fork. One is dead, one is alive. Who are you gonna ask for directions? That's a good, good answer. I like that answer. See, so here's the truth of the matter. When it comes to hope, many people are asking dead things for life. We keep pressuring dead things to want life from it. When in reality, all we got to do is go to the one that's alive. Human effort is not going to bring life to you. Nothing wrong with education, but ultimately it's not going to bring the true life that we need. There's nothing wrong with a career and, and success. There's nothing wrong with that, but that is never going to bring true life to you. There's only one that can bring hope. And when you put your life in his hands, he will give you hope. Everybody say hope. My wife's a great cook, an awesome cook. I'm telling you right now, she cooked. Matter of fact, I can't wait to get home after this service because I know she's made something really, really good. She's, I'm just being honest with you. She's probably a better cook than your wife. I'm just saying I'm just saying, just saying. Martha Stewart, not a chance. Uh, she, she's phenomenal. She wrote a cookbook that makes her legit. <clears throat> she's only had one time in our life where something that I've eaten that she made was just not good. Um, several years ago, actually, we, were, we didn't have children. We were in our, in our early 20s, and we lived in this little house in Richmond, Virginia, and she made a broccoli casserole. She's known for her casserole. She can make a casserole. However, this was the only dip in the relationship. Um, so I come in. We, you know, we're getting ready to have dinner. She puts down this broccoli casserole. And I think we had some chicken and other things like that. And I, you know, like a good husband, I take a big scoop of the broccoli casserole. I put it in my mouth. And then I realize this is the nastiest tasting thing I've ever had in my entire life. And, and I know, I mean, I've been married just for a few years. I know the right answer. How do I look in these jeans? Awesome. How do I look in this dress? Fantastic. What is my hair? How's my hair look? Beautiful. You're just sunshine. You're like a blue lagoon in, in, in the forest of trees. I don't know. I mean, I just, just do anything you can to make sure that, that, that you just, may, but this happened. I put it in my mouth and I'm like, oh, Jesus, what am I going to do right now? She says, what do you think of the casserole? I'm like, mm, mm, mm. I didn't want to swallow it. You know, I think I might have thrown up just a little bit in my mouth. And, and so I'm just sitting there wondering, how am I going to handle this? You know, I'm trying to, you know, I just, and then she puts some in her mouth. She goes, oh my gosh, this is terrible. And literally, I went, and I spit it all out on the ground. I'm like, thank you, Lord, this is terrible. And that's the only time. It's the only time. Just one little dip. That was it. The rest of everything's just up and to the right. <clears throat> so here's what she'll do. She'll call me many times. And she'll say, hey, sweetheart, I've made something wonderful for you. Make sure you're home at 6 o'clock. Don't be late. I know. I know. I, I make sure that I'm home. Not at 6. I'm home there at 545. I want to be ready sitting at the table because I know it's good. And here's, I'm telling you, this is what happens every single time. I'll open the garage door as I drive up. I'll open the car door and the smell has permeated through down the hallway into the garage. It will make its way around the front of the car, around. And as I open the door, the smell of that goodness 
will hit me in the face and he'd be like, oh, Jesus, I was kind of like, have a moment. Like Thomas, my Lord, my God. <laughs> I can't see it yet, but I know it's good. I can't see it yet, but I know it's good. See, that's what hope is. I can't see it yet, but I know it's good. Blessed are those that haven't seen yet believe. Let me tell you, God got something big for you this Easter. There's something great right on the horizon. Maybe you haven't seen it yet, but it's good. Can I just prophesy over you right now that God's about to do something good in your life. Things are about to shift in your life. Things are about to change in your life. The things that were dead are about to rise back to life. Can I get an amen? amen. When you put your life in his hands, you have certainty. When you put your life in his hands, you have hope. The confident expectation of good. Hope probably looks a little bit like what happened to Johnny. I grew up in a very dysfunctional family. And, uh, a lot of partying, drinking, a little bit of drug use. Uh, I always believed there was a God, but I always wanted to have my life in my own hands. When I was growing up, I was always what you call the uh, class clown of the school, so I was always in trouble. Uh, at the principal's office all the time, just doing different things that probably weren't the thing you should have been doing. I didn't really focus on my work at all. Things got a little bit less funny when I left school. Uh, I started experimenting around with prescription painkillers. That's where a lot of my problems actually began. Started to become a little bit uh, detached. Just kind of wanted to be by myself. Got quieter. I used to be a really sociable person. And when I started doing prescription painkillers, I stopped doing that. Uh, it affected my work ethic. Just the things I used to care about really kind of just went away everything kind of just goes away when you do it you just kind of feel numb it's almost like i didn't care about anything really i just wanted to do more drugs i got a phone call from my mom and she told me something was wrong with my dad and we needed to take him to the hospital me and my uncle my uncle came over and we had to carry him down the stairs and put him in the car and i got in the back seat And uh, I kind of put my arms around him. And we went to the hospital. And unfortunately, uh, that's, that's where he died, right there in the, back, uh, in the back seat on the way to the hospital. It's, it's really the sad thing about it. I mean, he died, and we all went home. And, my first reaction is just to go get high. Just pretty much stopped caring. I became filled with anger and hopelessness and depression. One day uh, I took too many drugs. Like I was pretty much just waiting to die. I was throwing up. I didn't have any, I haven't eaten in a couple of days, so I didn't have nothing in my stomach to throw up. That's when God came to me. And, or I believe it was God that came to me and he said that you don't have to live in this hell that you've created for yourself, that there's so much better for you, you just don't realize it yet. And I just got the feeling that I needed to get out of my hometown and just go somewhere new and start fresh. About a month of being down here, uh, my aunt had suggested that I uh, start attending Freedom House Church. That very first time here, I knew, I guess I figured there was something, there's something here. The third or fourth week that I knew it was, I just knew that day that it was time to give my life to Christ and just put my life in his hands and see what he could do with it. I got baptized about the end of 2014. Baptism was really exciting. It was a little bit nerve-wracking for me. It was like starting with a clean slate, pretty much. I could forget about all the problems I've had in my past and just start fresh from there on forward. God really started to show me the value of myself, how much I was worth. And I began to volunteer. 
come in and set chairs every week for the auditorium. Uh, I'd help set up for baptism, just really anything that I could do. A couple months shy into the new year, I made the decision to go back to school. Since I've given my life to God, He's changed everything. No matter how alone you feel or how dark it gets, if you give your life to God, He will change everything. Isn't that awesome? Come on. Isn't that fantastic? What a great story. Awesome, awesome. Johnny's right here on the second row. Stand up, Johnny. Come on, stand up, Johnny. Isn't that great? Awesome. Fantastic. God can really change your life when you put your life into His hands. You know, about 25 years ago, I came into a service much like this. And uh, I came in for one reason, and I bumped into God. That's how I describe it. God was there. Truth of the matter is, He was always there. He was just waiting for me to recognize Him. He's here today. And He's asking you. He's pulling on your heart. The Bible tells us that His Holy Spirit draws us. See, you think somebody invited you. Not real. Yeah, maybe they did, but the truth of the matter is, is God's been waiting for this moment since the beginning of your life. See, the two most important days you can remember are the day you were born and the day you found out why. God has such a great plan for you, such an amazing purpose, but it begins by putting your life in His hands because that's when you have certainty. That's when you can have hope. Would you bow your head and close your eyes today? Just everybody in this room, even in the risers, just bow your head and close your eyes. I don't want you looking around. I just want you to get alone with God, just between you and Him. This is, involves only you and Him. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you've never, ever put your life into the hands of God, you've given total, complete commitment. That feeling that you're sensing right now, that's the Holy Spirit. He's wooing you. He's pulling you in to that relationship because He knows that when you put your life in His hands, that God will take over. Open up your eyes, give you certainty and hope. Or maybe you're here today and at one point in your life you had put your life into His hands, but you took it back on your own. See, here's the great thing. God is a God of the second chance, the third chance, the 50th chance, the 1,645th chance. That's who He is. And He's right here today. Asking, will you put your hand, put your life back into my hands? Would you be willing to surrender just like Jesus did? I place my life in your hands. Father, I give my life to you. In just a second, I'm going to count to three. If you say in your heart, I want that. I want to place my life in his hands. I want you to do something bold. I just want you to raise your hand. When I get to three, I'm going to count to three. And right in this place right now, every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around, I want you to just lift your hand to heaven in a declaration of faith and hope in God. He loves you. He cares for you. One, don't hesitate. Don't wait. You need to do it today. Two, when I hit three in just a second, I want you to raise your hand, lift it high, lift it strong. I want to place my life in His hands. I want to give you my fears, God. I want to give you my pain, God. I want to give you my sickness, God. I want to give you my marriage, God. I want to give you my addiction, God. I want to give you my success, God. Are you ready? Just throw your hand up. Three, just lift it up. You say, that's me. Lift it up high, lift it up high, lift it up high. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, keep it up high. Keep it up. Keep it up. Here's all I want you to do. I want you to do this for me. If you raise your hand, I want you to take another bold step. I want you to stand up on your feet right now. You ready? Stand up right now if you raise your hand. Come on, stand up. 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 Stand up all across this room. Now here, hold on one second. Hold on one second. I want to take you. I want to get you to do, do something else. Now this is going to take a lot of boldness, but I know you can do it, okay? The Bible says... If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to step out and I want you to come down to the front. You, some of you have to excuse me, pardon me. That's okay. Just excuse me. Just grab your stuff and I want you to come down. I want you to come 
right now. Just get out of your seat and come down to the front. I want to pray with you. Every person that stood up. Church, would you give them the biggest hand you've ever given in your entire life? That these people just come down to the front. Come on down. Come on down here. Come on down. Come on down. Awesome. Congratulations, man. Proud of you, buddy. Congratulations. Congratulations. So proud of you. So proud of you. So proud of you. Way to go, buddy. Hey, everything's going to change for you. Everything's going to change. Come on. Keep clapping, guys. Keep on. Just come. Come. Pack on up here. Pack on up here. Come on down. Push your way all the way to the front. Could y'all come a little closer? Come on. Keep clapping, church. Come on. Keep clapping, church. Keep clapping. Keep clapping. Keep clapping. Come on down. Come on. Come on down. Keep clapping. Come on. Angels are rejoicing for you. Proud of you, buddy. Proud of you. Awesome. Congratulations. Proud of you. Proud of you. So proud of you. Everything's going to change. I'm telling you right now. There's something good for you. Don't give up. I'm glad you came today. I'm glad you came. It was hard to get here today, but you did it. You did it. I'm so proud of you. So proud of you. So proud of you, man. Way to go. Awesome. 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 Those of you that came, I want you to do something. And church, why don't you stand up with them? Come on, stand up with them. Everybody in the place, stand up. You guys that came, just look at me for a second. This is the greatest decision you've ever made in your life. Whether this is the first time you've made it, or maybe this is the 50th time. Let's let today be the one that sticks. Let's let today be the one that launches you into the greatness that God has for your life. I look in your eyes and there's so much hope. There's so much certainty that God wants to give to you. When you walk away from this altar today, I want you to know that you have a place in heaven. That you have an incredible, amazing Savior that's sitting at the right hand of God. And the Bible says He ever lives to make intercession for you and love you. He cares for you. He's praying for you all the time. All the time. So here's what I want you to do. I want you just to lift both hands to heaven. And we're going to pray this prayer out loud. I want you to say it loud enough so you can hear it with your own ears. Just say this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, believe I believe that you sent your son Jesus, sent your son Jesus to, die for me. to die for me. I believe, I believe that, I, that I am saved. I am, saved. I am, healed, I am healed. And I am whole. I am whole. When, I put my trust, when I put my trust, put my life, put my life in your hands. I believe, I believe that his blood, that his blood washes, me washes me of all my mistakes, all my mistakes and all my sins. All my sins. I, confess I confess you as my Lord, as my Lord and my Savior, my Savior. in Jesus' name. In Jesus. Thank, you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Awesome, 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 awesome. Give him a big hand. Isn't that fantastic?